So I want to thank you all for having me here. Um, if you've ever said to yourself, I hope somebody who sells software talks to me about economics for an hour on a, late on a Saturday afternoon, this is your day. <laughs> um, so like she said, I'm Katie Lockney, and I am the Economic Impact Advisor for the University of Denver's uh, Institute for Human-Animal Connection. Um, and my ties here are, you know, I go back with Austin a long way. My first dogs, actually, I adopted from Town Lake Animal Shelter about 20 years ago and uh, did my MBA right across the courtyard here. All right, let's see. So who is, who is the, the Institute for Human Animal Connection? They are an academic center with an agenda that is aimed at advancing the understanding of the human-animal bond. Um, in both individuals and organizations and also within communities. Um, and they do that, they have two main areas of focus. The first is the impact of animals and clinical interventions. So that's going to be a lot of your yeah, prison dog programs, your um, ther pet therapy programs, that type of thing. Their other track of study is the impacts of animals in communities. And that is where uh, these economic impact studies fall. So what are these economic impact studies? Well, they are an interdisciplinary attempt to understand the impacts of a project or policy, specifically in our case, an animal welfare project or policy on a community's well-being. And they also aim to understand animal welfare within the framework of One Health. Is everybody familiar with One Health? Um, so that is a concept that has been collaboratively, collaboratively put forth by the AVMA and the AMA that says, that the health of humans, animals, and the environment are interconnected. Um, the ultimate goal of these studies is to have better integration of animal welfare policies into broader policy making. So who, are, who is this motley crew that does these studies? Um, the team is comprised of economists, social workers, lawyers. They say MBAs, but they only want one, and that's me. Um, we use a methodology that is based in the social impact assessment framework that is put out by the International Association of Impact Assessments. And on top of that, we layer standard micro and macro economic analyses um, using implant and other modeling technologies. And I will get into all of that. And I don't know if that's a promise or a threat, but we'll talk about it. So what do these studies look like? Well, we take a systems approach to this impact modeling. We start with the inputs. What does a particular policy or project cost? We then move into what are direct and indirect effects. So, um, and we'll get into what all of that means later. We then look at some of the broader indirect effects and finally get into what are the, effect, the community effects. <coughs> we want to talk about three studies today. The first is the Oklahoma City, the OK Humane Compassion Center. This is a new shelter concept that Oklahoma City is kicking around. Um, they, they are looking to build a, an urban amenity complex and have this animal shelter actually anchor um, that complex. So it would be prime real estate, the middle of downtown, and they're looking to integrate humane activities into that urban core. So leaving your office at lunch and going to the shelter to walk dogs, um, having school kids come into the urban core for humane education programs, and then developing residential areas around that urban core that are very, very pet-centric and full of all of the pet-centric amenities that you would want to draw folks into your community. So from an economic input, socioeconomic impact perspective, um, our inputs here from a construction perspective, about $20 million, $4.5 million a year in operational costs. Come on. <laughs> um, for a five-year total cost of about $42 million, from an impact perspective, the outputs of construction would be a positive $35 million. Impact operations would have a benefit of $16.7 million a year for a five-year total impact of almost $119 million. Um, again, those broader induced impacts would be, you know, that core to shore, that urban redevelopment and revitalization project. And then ultimately, we looked at the effects on the community. So. We, we looked at potential improvements to physical health, improvements to workplace productivity, um, and improvements to mental health. And all of these studies that I'm gonna talk about, well, hold that thought. 
Here's the great unveiling. This is a study we have not published yet. This is the first time this data has been seen by anybody. So um, this is still pretty preliminary, but we thought this would be a good audience um, to, to use this as our, as our entrance for this study. I live in Denver. Denver has breed-specific legislation since 1989. So we took a look and to see what does this policy cost the city of Denver. From an overview perspective, since this has gone into effect, over 8,000 pit bull type dogs have been impounded. 5,000 of those were euthanized. We have seen 5,000 criminal citations. We've seen 2,900 criminal cases and in excess of 10 civil cases, including when the city sued the state and it ended up in the Supreme Court. The city of Castle Rock, which is just south of Denver, um, recently <coughs> repealed their BSL. Their BSL was almost as old as Denver's and uh, in May, it went away in favor of more progressive, dangerous do dog bylaws. So these numbers are going to look a little different than Oklahoma City. From an input perspective, it's cost the city, just from a pure enforcement perspective, about $6 million. This does not include any of the legal costs for those 5,000 criminal citations, those 2,900 cases, or any of those civil lawsuits um, that is going to be actually analyzed in a follow-up study, but quick cocktail napkin calculations put those in, you know, almost into tens of millions of dollars. So who doesn't want to spend $6 million to lose 143? Like, that's solid math. Um, so we've, we've calculated the lost revenue over these 29 years to be about $142 million. We also calculated what I have affectionately coined the bad neighbor cost. So once Denver decided to stop euthanizing those animals themselves, they shipped them out to the neighboring communities and put those costs into other communities in order to get themselves off the hook. So Denver's BSL has cost other people about a million dollars. So that's a total 29 year impact of a negative $143 million. And I'm gonna probably have to move back to Austin once people see these numbers. Yes, ma'am. Um, so very, f what, very few people in Denver actually know that there is BSL when they move there. So this is, we looked at revenue for um, not taking your dog to a vet in Denver. Not the, we looked at sort of the in-person costs. So you wouldn't go to a vet in Denver. You're not going to go to a boarding kennel in Denver. You're not going to go to a groomer in Denver. So over 30 years, that cost. Um, and then again, that bad neighbor cost is going to be um, what it's cost surrounding communities to take those dogs in. And this is a net cost because Denver does not take animals in return. So it is just these communities having to take those dogs. Um, the public, from a broader induced effect, the public safety promises that were made when BSL went into effect are not supported by the data. And from a community impact, we see that there is highly inequitable enforcement of these laws. Um, these laws are primarily and almost exclusively enforced in um, communities of color and in lower socioeconomic neighborhoods. So again, these, all of this information that I'm presenting today, all of the methodologies, all of the data sources are publicly available. And you're welcome, I don't wanna go too deep into all of this stuff because somebody will kill me, but um, you're welcome to take a look at those and follow up with us. Um, if you want all of the dirty details. So this is the study that I think most people here are interested in that I want to dive into the most. Um, this is Austin's no-kill resolution uh, passed in 2009, mandated that 90% live release rate. It involves a formal partnership between Austin Animal Center and Austin Pets Alive. There's substantial community engagement um, for this initiative. And uh, the common criticisms of no-kill have not been borne out by the data. Um, and the one, the first criticism we'll talk about is the one that probably everybody <coughs> here faces is it's gonna cost too much money. This is too expensive for a community to try to do. So as a quick look for the socioeconomic impacts of this initiative, um, we've calculated a no-kill premium of about $30.4 million. And we'll dive into all of these numbers in more detail, again, in, in a few slides. 
the outputs of this from an operations perspective, a veterinary and pet care perspective, as well as a retail perspective, is it has an impact of about $115.3 million. We then calculated what, uh, what we call brand equity, the, the, co the benefit of being known as a pet-friendly place. Um, and that calculation from the, over the course of 2010 to 2016 came out to about $72 million. So that is a net seven-year impact of $157 million. And then from that community perspective, um, what we looked at and what I'll talk about, improvements to public health, social capital, as well as community engagement. So brief history of no-kill, if anybody's not familiar. Back in the mid-90s when I moved here, Austin's live release rate was about 15%. Um, pet friendly was not on the top 100 descriptors of this city. Um, so in 1997, they passed a resolution that they called the No-Kill Millennium. And that resolution aimed to um, basically get to no-kill by 2002. While that did not happen, they were able to bring the live release rate up to about 50% by 2005. Come on in, the water's fine. So then in January of 2009, they passed another resolution that directed the Animal Advisory Commission to make recommendations, policies, procedures that would help reduce intake, would help reduce um, euthanasia, as well as increasing the live outcomes. So in November of 2009, they did pass what we will refer to as the no-kill resolution. It is what committed the city to a 90% live release rate. And possibly more importantly, it called for the immediate moratorium of euthanasia of animals. So um, in talking to Mike Martinez, who was the mayor pro tem at the time, who put this into effect, um, they passed it on, you know, say Thursday afternoon and Friday morning, 8 a.m., that was it. Um, that is probably one of the biggest criticisms that um, has been leveled against the city of Austin and how this was rolled out. So what helped me in understanding what Austin was doing from a no-kill perspective was understanding the dynamics of how animals move within the shelter systems in the city of Austin. So you can see that for Austin Animal Center, 16% of their animals come from non-study area communities, the study area being Travis County and 83% of their animals come in from Austin, um, from Austin, from Travis County. From an outcome perspective, 13% of their animals are transferred to either Austin Humane or one of the 115 rescue partners that they have. 17% of their animals go to Austin Pets Alive. 46% of their animals are adopted, 20% are returned to owner, and 3% 3 are, 3 are euthanized. And again, we took this just for one year to give an idea of who moves where um, in, in the city. And you can see that for Austin Animal Center, between 35 and 60% of their animals are in foster care. For Austin Pets Alive, that number is about 50%. So for Austin Pets Alive, they get about 40% of their animals from Austin Animal Center. They bring in about the same amount from non-study communities, so outside of Travis County. And they bring in about 20% of their animals through their PASS program, which is Positive Alternatives to Shelter Surrender, I believe. Um, their outcomes are 86% adopted, 11 return to owner, 3% euthanasia, and then there's a community cat number that nobody really is able to keep track of. So did no-kill work? Well, here's the trends in your shelter outcomes. If you look at 2005 and the 2009 adoption and euthanasia numbers, those lines have completely inverted. Any, I think, are we supposed to save questions to the end? We can take them now. Okay. Um, cool, so now it gets fun. Now it gets super fun. So again, these are the numbers I talked about originally. Um, the resolution premium, shelter operations, veterinary and pet care services, pet retail, and brand equity to get to that 47 or 157.4 million dollar number. All right, how do we get to these numbers? Glad you asked. So we, we calculated a, what we called a no-kill premium. And again, no one's ever done these studies before. So <coughs> we, we kind of have to figure this out as we go. And then we do reasonable check, reasonableness checks 
along the way. I'm hoping more people will start doing this kind of analysis so that we can all help each other. Um, but we calculated this premium because clearly there's a cost um, to doing this to the city. The first option that we took was looking at the cost per intake from to, uh, per animal from 2005 to 2009, looking at that same number from 2010 to 2016, um, subtracting them. So the average cost per intake went up about $265 post no-kill and multiplied by the 128,000 animals that came in to Austin Animal Center over those seven years comes out to about $34 million. The next approach we took was to do a city comparison, and I'll get to the cities on the next slide, but we looked at five cities, Austin being the sixth, and looked at their average cost per intake. And it turns out that average, Austin's average cost per intake is $208 more than the average of those five cities. So using that calculation times 128,000 animals, that came out to $26.7 million. So we averaged the two. And that is how we calculated the $30.4 million premium. What does it cost the city operationally? What does it cost Austin Animal Center operationally to implement no-kill? So these are the cities that we use to do this comparison. We picked these cities only because we were able to get the exact same data from those cities. We were able to get specific budget numbers. We were able to get specific animal intake numbers. So that just guaranteed we were doing an apples to apples comparison, um, but read no more into those city selections than that. All right, so now looking at the impact of shelter operations. We used, for the shelter operations, we used a tool called Implan. Implan is a modeling software that is widely used by cities, um, by universities, by um, courts to understand the impact of any particular project or policy. In fact, it's actually the same software the city of Austin uses when they are evaluating any publicly funded initiatives. So you have direct, within this model, you have direct impacts, which then lead to indirect impacts, which lead to those induced impacts, which then nets out at your total impact um, there at the bottom. So what does this mean for Austin's no-kill resolution? From a direct effect perspective, which would be staffing, payroll, and operations that resulted purely from that resolution, uh, you can see that that um, came out to $22 million. So the indirect effect, which would be um, buying, buying from suppliers in the local community. You might need additional veterinary medication. You might need wood. You might need chain link. You might need all of those things. Those secondary impacts in the economic community, um, about $6.6 .6 million. Then we get to your induced effect, which is the operations requiring labor services beyond the initial suppliers. So this would be um, people move to this community, they need realtors, they need accountants, they need pediatricians, um, they need wait staff, they need vets. So that came out to $12.2 million over those seven years for a total impact to the, sh to the community of about $41 million. And I do want to note that all of these calculations that we do, we are as conservative as we can possibly be. So when we, calculate, when we took into account the effect of Austin Animal Center operations, we only included 3.9% of their output. And so, and I will get to why we did that is because Austin Animal Center would have existed without no-kill. So there would have been a benefit to the community regardless of that legislation. Um, and so that's why we wanted to calculate just the impact of Austin Animal Center operation based on the no-kill. Does that make some sort of sense? Yes? No, so, no, so what, what I'm saying is that if we have, we have taken 96% of, of the economic benefit that Austin Animal Center provides out of this calculation. So again, being conservative, because we wanted to, we are looking at the benefit of that policy, Absolutely. only that policy. So that if you included, I think it ended up being $156 million if you included all of Austin Animal Center's 
um, impact. So again, we don't want to be overselling you know, things. We want to be conservative and we want to make sure that um, I'm in sales, but I, that I'm underselling you know, this. And that when you talk to your communities, your city councils, that you, you, know, you don't write a check that we can't cash, right? So moving on, we then looked at the, Im the impact of veterinary and pet care services. So what, what did no-kill do? No-kill increased the live release rate, right? So increasing the live release rate, you have more animals in the city, you're increasing the pet ownership rate. Um, is there a corresponding increase in spending? Um, how do you test that? Well, we took the county data and we took industry data. So we took vet care and pet care has its own industry code. And so we looked at the spending by county and then we looked at Texas. And we then looked at it on a per capita basis because the population of Travis County is increasing regardless of no-kill. So this is a way to level set that. And you can see that expenditures grew faster in Travis County since 2010 than they did in the rest of Texas. So what, what does that look like from a veterinary and pet care perspective? Pre-2010 uh, spending in Texas was about $82.69. Travis County was $120.95. Post no-kill, Texas went up to about $106. Travis County went to $161.39. We did what we call a but-for calculation. And what that means is if Travis County had increased their spending at the same rate of, as the rest of Texas, what would that spend be? Be $155.10. Which, so then we've calculated there a $6.29 surplus. That is a surplus that we attribute to no kill. So if you take 1.1 million folks in Travis County, you take $6.29 and you take seven years, that's where you come up with the $49.3 million. Then we calculated what percent of that surplus, what percent of the total spend is that surplus. That's where we got that 3.9%, and that is how we got to the number that we overlaid on the Austin Animal Center calculations. Are we good? Are you ready to like strangle me? Like you had law, then you had econ. It's like your worst nightmare for a Saturday. <laughs> All right, so then, so then we look, took a look at pet retail expenditures. And there is no industry code for pet retail. You can get dog food at a grocery store. You can get pet toys at Goodwill. Um, so we had to do more of an indirect calculation. So what we did was we took um, the American Pet Product Association puts out spend numbers um, every five years. We took a look at the veterinary care numbers. We took a look at the retail numbers. We calculated what percentage of total spend that was. And based on that $49.3 million for veterinary care, we came out with a no-kill impact of $25.3 million in the retail space. So like I mentioned, we have not done this before. No one's done this before. So along the way, we do what we call reasonableness checks. So for this, we took a look at animals that have been adopted out from Austin Animal Center and Austin Pets Alive, and we use life expectancy n numbers, and we calculated that based on all, if we just did a straight calculation of all the animals adopted out from 2010 to 2016 using these numbers, we would have ended up at $225 million of impact. So we feel pretty comfortable using 49 and 25 as a conservative as a conservative number. So then moving on to the final calculation, uh, th this is totally new. This brand equity is actually a new space um, completely. It plays off of the idea, if anyone's familiar with the idea of consumer product good brand equity, why you buy a particular brand versus another brand, why you buy that brand at one store versus another store, why when they lose your credit card numbers you go back or you don't. Um, so it's, it's relevant when a specific activity or project is essential to the identity of a region, not only to attract folks in the short term, but also to build long-term demographic and financial growth. 
So in this study, we looked at the increase in, pet in, uh, in population due to pet friendliness, and that was a survey that we put out uh, through the Chamber of Commerce. And then we looked at how much money was spent in the economy because those, based on those people. So how does brand equity function in a community? So as it pertains to Austin, um, almost 64%, I mean, I'm old, so I use, I, when I came out of college, I got a job and I had to move there. It didn't matter where it was, that's where I went. That's not how the kids do it these days. <laughs> they decide where they wanna go and then they go find a job there. And so Google was actually on the record as saying one of the reasons that they set up shop in Austin was because it attracted a young pet loving workforce. So there, you know, that's how brand equity works in a place brand equity works within a community. So again, that reasonableness check, are we just talking to ourselves here? Does this make any sense? We did a, a statistical analysis of the Google search, tra um, search terms for Travis County and found a, a very high correlation between the searches for pet friendliness and apartments for rent. So they, you know, people here, people are coming here, they're looking, pet friendliness is a driver for them. No kill signals that social awareness, which then signals a key demographic, right? So creating pet-friendly environments in your community can attract your community's ability to attract people instead of having them go maybe the next town over. This slide is gonna kill me. Um, so let, let me net this slide out for you. Um, what we did here is we isolated who's moving to Austin. And once we isolated who was moving to Austin, we looked into why they were moving here. So, the American Community Survey um, puts out a sur does surveys of communities to understand why people are moving, um, where they're moving, and it turns out that 10% of folks here are moving for a reason other than school, work, or a job. Um, so we took that 10% of folks, and then we multiplied that by the 15% of people who responded to the Chamber of Commerce survey saying that Austin's pet friendliness was a driver in their decision to move here. Um, that lands you at about one and a half percent of total net migration to Austin. And assuming a $60,000, you'll see there, uh, $60,000 annual income, the spend of those folks in the last seven years comes out to about $72 million. That's how we calculated the brand equity. Anybody? Well, no one's run out, so cool. Um, so that ends the number portion uh, of this, which I know is probably super exciting. Um, but looking into some broader impacts of no-kill in the community, I'll, most people are probably pretty familiar with the studies around um, companion animals and the correlation with improved health, improved mental health, improved social health, if you will. Um, so I'll, I'll leave that with you. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about this idea of social capital. Um, social capital is a mechanism that captures some of those informal transactions between individuals in a community that can actually amass a larger economic benefit. Um, the increased presence of companion animals in a community can act as a social bridge and enhance community cohesion. Um, studies indicate that keeping pets is associated with social contact and civic engagement. Um, Part of what we looked at in, in both Oklahoma and Austin, people who, are, and this is mostly pertains to dogs, but you know, cats as well, um, pet owners are 57% more likely to be engaged in their communities, and they're engaged in community initiatives that benefit the entire community. So we're talking about things like sidewalks, lights, open space. That's what we were talking about when we talk about social capital. Um, Neighborhoods that have people out walking dogs are perceived to be friendlier than neighborhoods that don't have people out on the streets. And we find that communities that have high dog ownership rates have lower crime rates because people are on the street, people are the first things to notice when something is off. Cars shouldn't be parked there, mail's piling up, what have you. So, um, so those are the type of community benefits that amass from having more animals in a community that don't necessarily hit anybody's P&L, right? So as I mentioned earlier, um, 
high degree of community engagement in Austin around no kill. Um, APA reported collecting about $16.5 million in donations um, with 50% of those coming from individual donors. Um, is anybody familiar with Ride Austin? Um, so Ride Austin is a local ride share because a few years ago, city council bounced Lyft and Uber out of town and uh, Ride Austin sort of came in in their place and at the end of your ride, you have the option to direct a donation from Ride Austin to a charity, a local charity, and APA is the most popular charity um, in, that, in that ride sharing app. They also have a thing in Austin called Amplify Austin. I believe it's coming up, but uh, it's about 700 charities and it's a big push for you know, one of the larger fundraising days. Um, in 2017, APA received a $1,000 donation match for having the most donors in an hour. They had a $5,000 donation match for having the most individual fundraisers out of all 700 charities. And I mean, this thing went up to like March of Dimes, you know, Big Brothers, Big Sisters, kind of the big boys. And over that course of that day, they had about 1,800, almost 1,900 donations, which was the most of any charity participating, and was 12th in total dollars at $136,000. So great, they, people, people give their pennies to, you know, and, injure, and support, you know, no-kill that way. This city steps up. I don't know if you remember, it seems like hours ago, when I pointed out that, you know, 50% of APA animals and between 35 and 60% of Austin Animal Center animals are in foster care. This is a city that shows up and actually takes those animals in. This town has 2,900 approved foster homes. I believe, like, is that the largest network in the country? The largest foster network in the country? Let's go with that. <laughs> if it's not the largest, it is one of the largest. Um, and APA had a 2,600 volunteer hours in, or volunteers in 2016, donated about 115,000 hours. Austin Animal Center had volunteers donating 49,000 hours. Okay, so then when I told people I was doing this study, they're like, oh God, so beyond the money, like, oh Katie, it's terrible. You do not want to do no-kill. You're gonna have strays, you're gonna have you know, mean animals, it's gonna push you know, these costs out to other communities, looking at you, Denver. Um, so I was like, well, okay, while I'm here, let's take a look at some of these complaints. So the first complaint was, and you might hear some of them yourselves, that Austin's gonna be overrun with stray animals. Um, well, one of the fun things I learned while doing this study is that dead animal pickup is the proxy for stray populations. So I got to talk to Solid Waste Services, do an open records request, and have them send me the count of every dead animal they'd picked up between 2010 and 2016. Don't let anybody tell you this is not sexy work. So, what we found was that the number of animals that were picked up before and after the resolution were not statistically significant. So it would be safe to conclude that no kill has not caused Austin to be overrun by packs of stray dogs. Did you separate out the wild animals? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we got them by species. Cats, dogs, deer, possums, skunks, raccoon. I mean, there's, people hit a lot of things in this town, I'm just saying. Um, <laughs> So the second complaint that we looked into was that the shelters in Austin would be full and that people would start taking their sh animals to shelters in surrounding communities and therefore those communities would end up bearing the brunt, the economic brunt of Austin's desire to keep all the puppies and the kittens. So I did an open records request for surrounding shelters. Um, we looked at Bastrop, we looked at San Marcos, and we looked at Williamson County and looked at all of their intakes and by originating zip code. And between those three shelters over seven years, they had 37 animals that came from an, a Travis County zip code, and that includes return to owners. So again, looking at the data, um, it would be safe to conclude that Austin is not pushing this problem out into surrounding communities. The third complaint was that, you know, if you're not gonna euthanize animals, you're going to have you know, wildly aggressive dogs put in, you know, manning the daycares. So we did a, a t-test analysis of severe and moderate dog bites before and after that resolution and shows that those did not vary significant, 
there's not a statistically significant difference um, in dog bites. So um, we were able to conclude based on that that this was not a public health danger. So now I'll say that there's probably other places to quibble um, about no-kill, but ideally now we can sort of put these discussions to bed and elevate the conversation, you know, into different areas that's more than yes it did, no it didn't, um, now we've actually got some data. So in conclusion, uh, good animal welfare policy is good economic policy and bad animal welfare policy is bad economic policy. Um, would, would be kind of how I net this out for you. So future studies that the Institute is, is looking at, um, community-based animal shelters, sheltering pet, po pet policies for rental housing, uh, low-cost veterinary <coughs> clinics, equine rescue res um, operations, community cats, and a, a study that I'm trying to champion, though they already <laughs> indulged me in BSL, but um, pets of the homeless. And in my head, what that would look like is um, there's a, a, a segment of the homeless population in any community that they term unreachable. And one of the characteristics of the unreachable population is that they own a pet. And they do not access any services provided by the community because they do not have a place to put their pet. So I would like to understand that if, can you use pets of the homeless as a vector to reach those folks? Could you stand up a, a veterinary clinic, some type of clinic that is also manned with mental health professionals, medical professionals? You know, what does it cost to, um, you know, see Edwin when he just has gout instead of Edwin when he shows up at the emergency room because he has to have his foot amputated? What if you can get Larry his bipolar medication rather than arresting him you know, every 15 days, you know, from an economic benefit perspective, um, if we have better services for pets of the homeless, what does that mean to, for the economics of a community? So this is, this is the team uh, that puts these together. Um, like I mentioned, PhDs, social work, Lone Ranger MBA, um, and also the graduate research assistants at the University of Denver's Institute for Human Animal Connection. If you thought this was all crap, you can email one of the first two gentlemen you know, on, on this slide. If you thought it was great, my email's right there for you. Um, we are always looking for ideas. Um, we are always looking for folks to poke holes in this. So like I said, these are all publicly available with sources and methodologies. So if anybody wants to rework those numbers. Um, this, this, to me, this is an important space because dollars matter and you need to convince your communities that this isn't just about petting puppies. You know, this isn't about playing with kittens. This is about elevating um, the financial profile of, you know, of, of an area and how you can use animals to do that. All right, well, thank you all. I appreciate you all letting me come back here and stomp around the homeland.